praise this morning.
understand that your spirit is always here.
this moment because you're never going to be alone. He's my comfort. He's my this morning we're thankful that we're not alone Father if there's one person that walked into this room this morning and feels like they've lived all week by themselves I pray that you would remind them this morning that we are not alone you never leave us you never forsake us you're just as close as the mention of your name so we declare the name of Jesus this morning the fact that Jesus gives us victory we move from victory to victory in our lives thank for thankful this morning jesus that we don't have to fear any weapon any scheme any trick of the enemy that we can stand firm in the fact that you are with us fighting for us interceding for us praying for us lifting up our knees to the father and so we are thankful this morning that we're not alone we're not alone You've got our backs. You're our comfort. You're our comfort. Your presence produces peace in our lives this morning. Regardless if we're on the mountaintop or if we're in the valley, your presence produces peace. Knowing that you're with us. God with us. Emmanuel, that you are God with us. Produces confidence and faith we trust your track record of presence we trust the persistency of your presence the consistency of your presence the fact that you're always here when we need you most so father if there anyone in this room today that needs a touch a physical touch i pray that you would begin to manifest the healing virtue of Christ in this house right now. Knowing that that the sacrifice has been made, I just pray that right now that healing would overtake our physical bodies. And Father, we pray for any other kind of need that may exist in our midst this morning, financial, emotional, relational, spiritual, whatever it is that we have need of, we recognize that when your presence comes into a house, when your presence is with us, that our needs are met and so we claim those things as done in Jesus name come on can you just sing that again hallelujah I'm not alone can you just sing that as a testimony this morning Thank you, Jesus.
just sense your arms wrapping around us, pulling us close to you. And for those of us that are in relationship with you, Jesus, I pray that we would sense your presence and we would draw closer to you. But Father, I'm praying that if there's one in this house today that does not know your son Jesus, that they would take advantage of this moment and recognize that without your son Jesus, they are alone. But I pray this morning that they would surrender their heart and life to you. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. If you're here this morning, you say, Steve, I don't know Jesus. I'm not in relationship with him. And I need to surrender my heart and life to him because I don't want to be alone. Would you just raise your hand? You can pull it right back down. We will not embarrass you. We just want to pray intelligently so we can get the materials in your hands. Father, search our hearts. I pray that today, before this day is over, that we can testify, every each and every one of us, that, that we sense your presence, that even in the privacy of our own car, maybe in the maybe we're the only one in the house today, I just pray that when we walk in the door at home, we would sense your presence and recognize that we are not alone, that you placed us together, that we are here for one another, and that your presence is with us. I pray that we would represent you well everywhere we go today. I pray that we would represent you well in the moments to come as we welcome one another into your house. I just pray that we would allow you to move through us and allow your love to be shown to one another through us. And Father, we'll give you the glory. We bring, bring our movers to you, Father. These are my ten. This is the ten I wrote down. I pray that each and every one of us would have a list either in our hands or on our hearts of people that we know don't know your son Jesus. And I pray that you would use us as a witness to bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus. We claim our movers, brothers and sisters, prodigals, sons and daughters, aunts and uncles, co-workers and classmates, neighbors that we long to see come to know your son Jesus. I pray that they would surrender their heart and life to you so they don't have to do life alone. And Father, we'll give you the praise for it. And everybody said, amen. Come on, would you find two or three people and welcome them into the house of the Lord before you're seated this morning? The story as in a best friend, a love interest, or a sidekick. And when I read that definition and I saw the word sidekick, I instantly, I, I'm going to date myself and show you how old I am. I remember, don't, don't amen that part, Tar. I, I, I remember some shows with some important sidekicks like uh, Batman. Batman had a sidekick by the name of 
Robin, all right? Some of you young folks in here don't understand. Y'all haven't seen the real Batman because the real Batman had the, the bams and the booms and the kazams and all the stuff. That If you didn't see that Batman, I, I feel for you, you were not raised correctly and you were deprived and you should have been raised right. That's the real Batman. But, but there was another show. Now, I'm going to really show how old I am now. I still have the figurine of his horse. I like the show because of the horse. His name was the Lone Ranger. And the Lone Ranger had the cool gun, the silver gun and the silver bullets. And he had his, his horse by the name of Trigger. Yeah, not, not, not. yeah, but he did have a sidekick. And his sidekick's name was... Tonto, good job, Kimo Sabi. Yeah, okay, so so the Lone Ranger would get into all these situations, and all of a sudden Tonto would come out of nowhere and save the day. He couldn't, the Lone Ranger couldn't be the Lone Ranger if he didn't have Tonto. Then there's another one. There's another one. There's a there's this guy that had three sons, and this woman who had three daughters, and they marry and they move into the same house, and it's the Brady Bunch, but there was a, 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 a hidden figure in the house that always brought flavor and, and, and a little depth to the story, and her name was Alice, right? You can't have the Brady Bunch if you don't have Alice. She wasn't the lead actor. She wasn't the main actor, but she provided the depth and the flavor. Well, history is, is um, full of people that, that have gone unseen sometimes and unnoticed sometimes, but they're pivotal to the, to the dialogue, to the history. In fact, um, usually they're people who have faced significant challenges to be able to use their gift and, and they don't have a position of wealth. They, they, they don't have a lot of money. They may not have a lot of um, authority. They may not have a lot of uh, flair, but, but even though we don't know their names, they impact the storyline. They have a significant role to play. And the truth is this morning is that the Bible is full of unseen heroes or hidden figures that we don't even know their names, and yet they had an, a dramatic impact on the story. I happen to be a real big fan of the Old Testament, uh, and I think it's because it almost reads like an action movie sometimes, like there's blood and gore and fights and wars, and uh, it's, a, it's a guy thing, I get it, but, but, but I like it. Like it, it yeah, so, so there's a story in the Old Testament, one of my favorite stories of the Old Testament. I'm going to read it to you because I think we can learn from from these hidden figures that fight their way out of the shadows to dominate and impact the story. So I want you to join me this morning in 1 Samuel. We're going to start in 1 Samuel 13. We're going to read in verse 19. We'll skip down to verse 22 and 23. And then we'll skip down into chapter 14. Don't worry. I'll, uh, I'll tell you when we're switching so you'll understand. This is 1 Samuel chapter 13, beginning of verse 19. There were no blacksmiths at all in the land of Israel in those days. For the Philistines wouldn't want them, wouldn't allow them for fear of their making swords and spears for the Hebrews. So in other words, the Philistines were uh, fighting against the children of Israel and they, they took all the blacksmiths captive so they couldn't make swords and spears. Pretty smart. So, so then verse, nine, uh, verse 22 through 23, so there was not a single sword or spear in the entire army of Israel that day except for Saul and Jonathan. I want to tell you right now, if you're in an army where only one person has a sword or two people have sword and spears, how many, do you, how many of you know those are the people you want to hang out with? Like if Tari's got the only weapon and we're going into a fight, I'm hanging out with Tari, right? That's what's going on here. They, they're the only two that have a sword, and a spear. Then it says, The mountain pass at Michmash had meanwhile been secured by a contingent of the Philistine army. Chapter 14, beginning in verse 1. A day or so later, Prince Jonathan said to his young bodyguard, or the way I was brought up reading it, his armor bearer, he says to him, Come on, let's cross the valley to the garrison of the Philistines. But he didn't tell his father that he was leaving. Meanwhile, Saul was taking it easy under the pomegranate tree at the threshing floor on the edge of town of Gibeah or Gibeah. And there were about 600 men with him to reach the Philistine garrison. Jonathan had to go over a narrow pass between two rocky crags, which had been named Bozes and Sina. The crag on the north was in front of Michmash, and the southern one was in front of Gibeah. Yes, let's go across to those heathen, Jonathan had said to his bodyguard. Perhaps the Lord will do a miracle for us, for it makes no difference to him how many enemy troops there are. Fine, the youth replied, do as you think best. I'm with you heart and soul, whatever you decide. 
All right, then this is what we'll do. Jonathan told them, when they see us, if they say, stay, stay where you are or we'll kill you, then we will stop and wait for them. But if they say, come on up and fight. In other words, while we're crawling up here, when the, if the enemy sees us and they say, bring it on, then this is what we're going to do. So come up here and fight. Then we will do just that, for it will be God's signal for us that he will help us defeat them. And when the Philistines saw them coming, they shouted, look. The Israelis are crawling out of their holes. Then they shouted to Jonathan, come on up here and we'll show you how to fight. That was a bad mistake. That was a bad mistake. Come on, climb right behind me, Jonathan exclaimed to his bodyguard, for the Lord will help us defeat them. So they clambered up on their hands and knees and the Philistines fell back as Jonathan and the lad killed them right and left, about 20 men in all, and their bodies were scattered, scattered over about a half an acre of land. And suddenly panic broke out through the entire Philistine army and even among the raiders. And just then there was a great earthquake increasing the terror. So there was a headliner in this account. There is a star of the show. He is the king's son. He, he's got all the attention. In fact, he's so big a star that he's one of only two men in the entire army that have a sword. His name is Jonathan. We know about Jonathan. We know a lot about Jonathan. In fact, you can continue to read out through Samuel and you will discover that Jonathan goes on to star in many more accounts throughout the accounts there. And we recognize he's the star of the show. He's favored. He's preferred. He, I'm going to say another P word so I can spit on Tari more. He's, uh, he's uh, provided for. He's, uh, he's the prince. Uh, 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 uh. And so, so he's this big time guy. But, but the truth is, is that in this account, there's another individual. He is the hidden figure. He's the armor bearer at Jonathan's side and he's unknown and he's unnamed. We never discover his name. But, but his role and his attitude teaches us lessons that we need to learn. Here's the first one I want you to see. I want you to notice first that when Jonathan explains what God is placing in his heart, this hidden figure, this, this armor bearer that nobody knows who he really is, he comes alongside and he says, whatever, whatever is in your heart, Jonathan, I'm with you. I'm with you. Whatever you think, Jonathan, if, if you think God is saying to do this, I'm with you. That's an interesting thing because in reality what's taking place is the armor bearer is putting his fate and his destiny and his future in Jonathan's hands. This was a suicide mission. But here's the lesson I want you to learn out of this. What, what this armor bearer teaches us is that often serving God looks like serving man. Did you, did you get that? He's serving, he's serving Jonathan, but the truth is, is what he's really doing is he's serving the call of God in Jonathan's life. Whatever God tells you to do, Jonathan, in your heart, that's, I'm with you. I will cooperate with you. I will participate in this because I sense the call of God in you. So I'm serving you, but what I'm really doing is I'm serving God. Oftentimes, when we're serving man, we're serving God. It, it, when, when we feel the call of God on our life and I, and I help and I assist and I put my life out there, I may be serving a, an individual, but the truth is, is I'm actually serving God. See, this unnamed hero had confidence in God, but he also had to come to this place where he had confidence in the trusted leader. And as I walk through this church sometimes and, and as I interact with church people, not just this church, but other churches, I see so many of you that have been hurt by leaders and they, you trusted them and they've disappointed you and you're disillusioned and uh, disillusioned and they bruised you and they made mistakes and they let you down and, and, and you're limping and you're hurt. But, but what I want to say to you this morning is you've got to come back to that place where you trust somebody's heart that you trust the God in them, that, that, that when they speak and when they say, God is calling me to this, you trust them enough, then you trust the God in them so that you recognize I'm not just serving them, I'm serving the God that's laid this on their heart because too many of us are willing to serve God, but we won't serve people. And I just need to tell you the truth this morning that, that we need to come to grips with is that the way we flesh out serving God is by serving people. Thank you, Tari. I appreciate the help. Uh, we we got to learn to trust the God in people, to follow the people that God puts in our lives. 
We can't be so, so hesitant. Our fear of being hurt by leaders can cause us to hold back. And at some point, you're going to have to put your future and your faith in someone's hands in obedience to God. God's going to call you to do something. But in order for you to be able to do what he's called you to do, you're going to have to trust the people that God has placed in your life to lead you correctly. I know you've been hurt in the past by leaders, but you can't allow their failures to keep you bound in fear that will keep you from participating in victory. When you're serving people, you're serving God. You cannot disconnect those two. The second thing I want you to notice is this. This armor bearer recognized that he had a role to play. Here's the lesson he teaches us. That victories are not won in isolation, but rather victories are won in cooperation. I'm going to say that one more time. We've got to get this. Victories are not won in isolation. They are won in cooperation. He recognized that I have a role to play. I may not be the star. I may not be the headliner. But I have a role to play. He knew that although Jonathan was called to fight, he couldn't win by himself. Can you imagine what this account, how this account would have gone if Jonathan had showed up to face these guys by himself? He might have got one or two of them. But eventually they would have encircled him and come up behind him and killed him but because he had somebody that believed in him and trusted him and served alongside of him who knew that he had a role he was protected and they went see even though he wasn't called to swing a sword he was called to carry the sword he realized that his assistance was absolutely necessary for them to win the victory how many of us fail to participate in miracles how many of us fail to set miracles into motion how many of us uh, miss victory simply because we won't cooperate or participate we just hang out by ourselves I need to tell you this morning this truth. I, I hope you'll grasp this truth, and that is this, that there are no great victories without service. You will never win a victory without serving. I know too many people walking around going, oh, I just need Jesus, just Jesus and me. Well, I'm glad that's worked out for you, but that hadn't worked out so well for me because what I've discovered is that Jesus put people in my life that I can rely on and that I can trust and that when I'm weak, they're strong. And when they're weak, I'm strong. And when I call them, I, I recognize that as we are participating and cooperating with one another, victories are won that I could never win by myself. I could never do this by myself. But when I've got them, when I call Tari and I'm feeling down, I get, I get encouraged when I speak to Seth, I get encouraged. When I speak to Jack, I get encouraged. When I speak to Teresa, I get encouraged because it's like God in them speaks to me. It's together. And I can prove it out of Scripture, Romans chapter 12, verse 4 and 5. Just as there are many parts to our bodies, so it is with Christ's body. We're all parts of it, and it takes every one of us, it takes every one of us to make it complete. For we each have a different work to do. So, here it is, listen to this. We belong to each other. Did you get that? We so, I want you to touch your neighbor right now and say, you belong to me. You belong to me. You belong to me. You're mine. You, you can't get away from me. You belong to me. I, you, we, we belong together. You belong to me. And together we win. So, you belong to each other and each needs all the others. The roles are different. But both were essential. The armor bearer challenges us to do this, to help someone, listen to this, who would lose without your help. I want to say that again. The armor bearer teaches us that there are people in the body that I'm assigned to. They belong to me. They, they're, they're part of me. And they would lose without my help. And I need to rally to them and assist them. Jonathan gives us this glimpse into what this armor bearer understood. He says this. He says, armor bearer, we're going to crawl up here, and, and this is what we're going to do. If the enemy says, come on up, we'll go on up. Perhaps God will give me a miracle. Right? Is that what he says? Nope. nope, that's not what he says. He says this. He says, we're going to crawl up there, and if they say, come on up to fight, then he says, perhaps God will give us a miracle. Maybe we're not getting the miracle we're asking for simply because we're asking for a miracle for me instead of uh, you, uh, together us uh, saying, listen, God, when we show up and when we serve and we participate and co cooperate, then, then we're asking a miracle for us. For us. 
I, I think he understood that this, this armor bearer understood that they could together be used by God. I think he understood that his help was the trigger to God's help. Can I submit to you this morning that some of you are, 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 are the, the, the trigger when, when somebody in this body, somebody in, in the relationships that you have outside this body, they need a miracle. You're the trigger. If you would just participate and cooperate, you're the trigger because here's the truth. Your assistance precedes God's assistance. Mm. I just got to help you this morning. I think some of y'all are sitting around praying for God, for God to do a miracle. God, we're waiting on you to do a miracle. We need you to do a miracle. We need you to come through. And I think God's in heaven going, I'm waiting on you. Because you know that the person that you're praying for a miracle for needs, needs financial provision. And you got 20 bucks in your pocket and you won't assist. And you're the, you're, your assistance precedes my assistance. So when you reach out and plant that $20, I can turn it into 200 I can turn it into 2000 But first you got to plant the seed. I need you to do it first. You know they need their yard mowed. But you're waiting around on me to send somebody. Why don't you go get the mower out of your garage and go mow their yard? Your assistance precedes my assistance. We've got to serve. And the third thing I think that's important for us to see in this account this morning is that this single, this, this hidden figure single-handedly guarded Jonathan's back and he made it possible for Jonathan to win. <clears throat> but we don't even know his name. <clears throat> we don't even know his name. Does anybody know the armor bearer's name? No. I even went back and read it several times because I started to think about some other accounts in the Old Testament. Like, uh, do y'all remember the account of Goliath? That David walks up on this battlefield, and, and there's this giant coming out, and he's yelling at the army of Israel, and everybody's scared of him. And Jonathan says, what will be done for the person that kills this giant? And, and he's told, well, if you kill the giant, the king will give you his daughter in marriage. He will, pay, he will allow it so that your family never has to pay any more taxes. He gets rewarded for killing Goliath. So I went back and read this because Jonathan would have never won this victory without this armor bearer. So I began to ask the question, what did this armor bearer get out of it? What reward did he get? None. There is no record anywhere that he received anything. He doesn't, we don't know his name. He received no awards. So apparently he wasn't concerned about credit. He was concerned about the cause. I want to tell you this morning that a lesson we need to learn from this account is this, is we must decide. I'm just challenging you to decide this morning. Are we more concerned or consumed about the credit or are we concerned and consumed by the call? We have to come to grips with that this morning. See, uh, if this armor bearer had been concerned about credit, he would have just probably stayed back with Saul because I read it to you, but the Bible says that Saul was hanging out under the pomegranate tree. With 600 men, he was just chilling, just relaxing, taking it easy, no risk, no, no, no danger. I'm just going to relax right here. But Jonathan says, this is what God wants us to do. And the armor bearer responds to the cause and says, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. I'll do it. I'll, I'll take the risk. How many of us relax and how many of us are playing it safe and how many of us refuse the chance coming early or stepping outside of our comfort zone? How many of us are worried about recognition and thanks? And while we're doing that, while we're worried about whether somebody's clapping for us or whether somebody's thanking us or whether somebody's patting us on the back, while we're doing that, people are still in bondage and people are still oppressed and, uh, and people are still disillusioned and people are still hurt and people are still sick because we're worried about credit instead of responding to the cause cause what if the breakthrough that you've been asking for for your children or for your neighbor or for your re, your your relative is tied up in your willingness to serve in a way that makes it possible for somebody else to preach and somebody else to greet and somebody else to sing and somebody else to minister what if your service frees up somebody else to be able to do what would set the person you've been praying for free but they can't do it because you won't serve what if you greet and no one ever says thank you? What if you sing and nobody says, hey, you did a great job? What if you run the lights for some, some event and no one ever notices? What, what if you wave at a passing car and nobody ever stops? Does it really matter? Is it worth it? It is if we're concerned about the cause more than we're concerned about credit. 
In, in Colossians, uh, the, the writer teaches us how we should serve. Uh, and, and I think the armor bearer must have understood this before it was written because Paul comes along in Colossians and he's writing to, to actual slaves. Actual slaves. They're, they're in the worst possible scenario. They're slaves. They're owned by somebody. That's not a good environment to live in. And yet Paul says this. He says, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that they will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. Let me read it out of another version. Servants, do what you're told by your earthly masters. And don't just do the minimum. Let's, let's apply this to work right now. Let, let, let's stop right there. Let's apply it inside the four walls. Don't do just the bare minimum that will get you by. Do your best. Why? Work from the heart for, for your real master, for God, confident that you'll get paid in full when you come into your inheritance. Keep in mind always that the ultimate master you're serving is Christ. The reason we serve the reason we fight our way out of the shadows, the reason we take the risk is supposed to be because we're serving Christ, not people. Well, what if I do these things and they never say thank you? Doesn't matter. I'm in for the cause, not the credit. I recognize that in the church world, there are people that get the big acclaim. They're on the stage. They have the microphone. Everybody claps for them. Everybody approves of them. But, but, but what about the other people? But if nobody ever says thank you, what you do matters. What you do matters if you serve for Christ. We are, a very, we are at our very best when we serve in such a way that all the glory and all the credit and all the attention goes to him. This ensures that it doesn't matter if anybody claps or if they complain. Anybody ever had anybody complain? Anybody had at work this week, did anybody call you up and complain and ream you out? The, 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 man, they just, drive me, they just complain all the time. I can't satisfy them. You're not doing it for them. You're doing it for Jesus. When I, when I treat my wife the, the way I, I'm supposed to, I'm not doing it just because I love her. I do it because I'm doing it for Jesus. When I treat my kids with respect, it's not because they deserve it because sometimes they don't, but I treat them with respect anyway because I'm doing it for Jesus. When you're dealing with your boss at work and he's a jerk, and I get some of the fact that some of you work for a jerk, when he's a jerk, you don't treat him with respect because he's nice. You, you treat him with respect because you do it for Jesus. We honor the teachers in the house today as they get ready to go back to school but we don't teach, we don't treat our teachers with respect because they went to college and got a degree we treat them with respect because we're doing it as if we were doing it to Jesus are you credit hungry or are you cause hungry if you're cause hungry you will do what you do and you will fight yourself fight your way out of the shadows whether anybody ever knows it or not um, I don't know if you know this, and, and I'm almost done. I just want to share this little bit of information with you. I don't know if you know this, but the average church in America, 20% of the people do all the work. Did you know that? That's why uh, I, I go around sometimes. I look at these other churches. I don't even know how they stay in existence. 20% of the people do all the work. That's why some people burn out. They do everything. That's why you see them all the time doing everything. They do 20% of the people do all the work. That's not the case here. At Passion, at the size of our congregation, and it's hard for some of you to understand how large we are or how small we are because you come to this service and there's another service and you don't even know how many people. But let me just tell you this. Uh, just go like this. Do, do, do the, would you do this with me? Would you go? Come on, on the count of three. One, two, three. It's going to blow your mind. In the size of congregation that we have, did you know that we have 130 volunteers? <laughs> Blows my mind. I'm so thankful. For those of you in this congregation that work so diligently, so faithfully, we're trying to highlight those hidden figures because some of you don't even know what some of the other people in this place do. So out in the lobby now for the next three weeks, there's this board and uh, there's this little card that says hidden figures and it's got their pictures. It's not the best pictures. I told them, I told them in first service, I said, these pictures are rough, man. They're instant film. I mean, you don't get, you don't get great. In fact, we took some of them on last Wednesday night during the block party when it was 186 degrees outside and we'd been there for an hour. It, these are rough. I, these are not glamour shots, but it shows you the faces of the people that serve so faithfully and diligently 
to make what we do possible. The reason we can do block parties is people like that that are out on the board. And the reason we can have service and you can come to a clean building and worship is because of people you don't even know are here before you get here. The reason you have coffee to drink when you walk in is because people get here before you do. They're hidden figures. And they deserve our honor. The Bible says to give honor to whom honors do. But I did, you, well, you just, you just said you had 130 volunteers, so you don't need me. That's not what I said. That is not what I said. Because this morning, what I want to do is I want to challenge you to fight your way out of the shadows. I read it to you out of Scripture that every part is necessary. We need you. You have a gift inside of you. In fact, may I submit it to you like this? We're around here praying like this. God, give us a miracle. But sometimes we can't pray, give us a miracle because we don't have us. Well, I see that lady singing all the time. The reason she's singing every week is because some of you got a gift you're not using. I see the same person in the, in the kids' area every week. The reason you do is because some of you aren't serving. I see the same guy out there putting up the flags every week. I wish Phil was in here. I'd point him out. He's out there every week, early in the morning, putting the flags out, pulling the train out. He's out there doing it because some of you won't serve. We need you. You're a hidden figure. And you say, well, I, 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 will anybody ever notice? What difference does it make? If Jesus notices, then it's worth it. If somebody gets saved because you did what you do, then it's worth it. Your gift matters. And so I'm asking you to get plugged in. I want you to do two things. First, I want you to go out in the lobby and look at, at all the people that are so faithfully serving and read their little card. It tells why they serve. But I'm also asking those of you that are not serving right now to get in the fight. We could win. There are battles we are called to win. There are issues that we're called to resolve. There are people that we're called to reach that we will never reach without you. I'm, I'm, I recognize that maybe in your past the church has hurt you and now you're just cynical and I'm not even going to help. Listen, I, I'm just asking you to come back to that place where you get tied up in the cause again. Say, I'm, I'm for you. Whatever's in your heart. Because see, there are some of you in this room this morning that your gift is that you could give financially and make it possible for us to win some battles. Some of you can give your gift, like your service. Maybe you don't have any money. You say, well, I don't have any money to give, but you've got a gift. And if you would use your gift, it would change everything. We need you in this battle. I need armor bearers to come alongside I, and uh, make sure I got the mic in the right hand so I can actually do it so they can watch my back because with this hand I can't reach my back right now. Yeah, but I need people to come and say, I got your back. And as we surround one another and we love on one another, we win. God, give us a miracle. There's got to be an us. And so I want to challenge you this morning. If you're not serving, I want to challenge you to take this card and uh, there'll be the little instant camera out there and it, for just a moment, put your glamour shot in your own mind on your little card right there because then we're going to put the instant camera shot and it won't look so good. But, but, but we're going to ask you to go out there and take this card and put your name on it what team, and why you want to serve and, and let us sign you up. Get involved because victory never comes in isolation. It only comes as we cooperate. Father, this morning I pray a prayer of thanks for the us in this room, those that so faithfully serve week after week, the people that give their life serving in so many different ways, preparing coffee, putting out signs, hanging flags, cleaning buildings, working with the kids, singing, running sound, all the stuff that makes what we do possible, giving and the offering. And I'm thankful. But I also recognize that there are individuals in this house this morning that are not plugged in and they're not in the fight and because of what we're losing in areas. Some people can't serve in the areas you've called them because other people aren't stepping up. And so, Father, I pray this morning that you would challenge each and every one of us this morning and we would come out of the shadows and we would give our gift. We would make it possible we would participate so that together miracles take place in the lives of people that we're praying for, believing for. We recognize that our assistance usually precedes your assistance simply because you're waiting on us. 
And so, Father, I pray that you would motivate us and challenge us to get plugged in, to get in the fight so that victories can be won. And, Father, we'll give you the glory and the honor and all the credit. It belongs to you. They may never say thank you. No one may ever clap for us. We may never get a pat on the back. But we do what we do for your credit and for your glory and for your honor. And we thank you this morning that you see what we do. So we do our very best in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Can we give it up for our pastor to bring that word? Um, I'm thankful um, because there's a lot of hidden things that he has to do to prepare um, for Sunday. So I'm thankful for Pastor as he prepares to bring us words. Um, As the ushers move to receive the tithes and offerings, um, I just want to welcome you to Passion. If this is your first time inside of the um, seat right in front of you, there is a new or our next step card right here. We want you to go ahead and take it. Um, Fill it out and give it to our new here desk, and that is right outside. You couldn't miss it whenever you walked in. That is where the coffee was at. So that'll be, um, take this card, fill it out, take it to the new here desk, and they will give you a gift. Along with that, if it is your second time, then go ahead and see Pastor Steve. Uh, He also has a gift for you, and it is a great and delicious gift. Um, On the screen behind me, you will see a phone number. If this morning you received Christ for the first time, I want you to go ahead and text that number and say, SAVED. Um, And if you felt convicted and you felt like you want to um, serve, then we encourage you to also text that number and say served or serve, sorry. Um, And then also go ahead and take your hidden figures thing, fill it out thing, hidden figures card, fill it out, um, take it out there as well. But also we would love for you to text this number if you got saved this morning or if you would like to serve and check out these announcements. service we will sing have a short message and then hang out together to eat play some games and fellowship stay tuned for more details in the coming weeks thank you so much for joining us here at passion we hope to see you again next week Amen. Stand with me this morning as we pray to dismiss. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for how good you are. Um, Father, we thank you for speaking to us through Pastor Steve. We pray that you would continue to speak to us throughout this week um, and give us more opportunities to serve your people. And we give you all the praise. Protect us as we go. In your precious name, Jesus. Amen. Amen.